being a preacher is not an easy job. There's a lot of misconceptions about preachers. You know, we only work one day a week, right? But you got to think about our one day of work every week. When we're up here, we're scrutinized. When we're, we're up here, we're being constantly observed. When we're up here, we're being constantly recorded. You see, it's your job... What you do is not always on display and not always on record, but what we do is. And so what ends up happening is that some of your worst moments get caught on camera. And if you will, Nick, go ahead and play for for me on that. I don't have a microphone. I just realized that. So I want to try to go into Ben Hogan mode for just a moment. Working on brother. (laughs) Maybe thinking, oh, it's like a... uh, uh, I, I, can't, I can picture it, but I can't say it. The thing that birds go bathe in. What? Bird bath, yeah. <laughs> I thought there was like a much more significant name there. That's that we have to have a lot of things more. Sorry, I just got a massive cramp in my leg. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, it ain't going away. Hold on. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mingu. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh. You sit on Satan's throne. That's right. Came back and got him. <laughs> Whoa. Uh, I was surprised that, you know, yeah. I made him have that. I think I'm I was, sorry. I, I was pretty surprised, too. Okay. <laughs> sorry to interrupt you. Okay. Okay. I'm finished. <laughs> well, I share those uh, worst moments from this year, and that's just from this year, that's just from June on, so I didn't even want to go further back and find what might else be there, but I I share a few of my worst moments while preaching and or teaching this year to make the point that everyone has bad moments. We've got one happening right now. Everyone has bad moments, no matter who you are. No matter what you do, no matter what era you live in, you're going to have bad moments. And the one thing I love about the Bible is that it is replete with bad moments. The Bible does not sugarcoat discipleship. The Bible makes it very clear that every follower of God is going to have a bad moment. Abraham had the whole lying about his wife thing. Moses had the whole killing an Egyptian thing. (coughs) Excuse me. David had the whole affair with Bathsheba thing. And on and on and on you can go with bad moments in the Bible. But few can match Peter when it came to the sheer volume of bad moments because Peter had so many of them. There was the time he nearly drowned in the Sea of Galilee because he let fear overtake his faith in Matthew chapter 14. There was the time he rebuked Jesus for claiming that he would be killed, which resulted in Jesus saying, Get behind me, Satan, in Matthew chapter 16. There was that time he suggested that they build tabernacles for Jesus, Moses, and Elijah when they were on the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17. And there was the time he tried to decapitate a guy in the Garden of Gethsemane in John chapter 18. But Peter's absolute worst moment was obviously when he denied Jesus. Let's read what happened on that occasion. Matthew chapter 26, verse 69 through 75. Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came up to him and said, You also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you mean. And when he went out to the entrance, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you too are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to evoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed, 
And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Now I want you to consider with me today what's, what's significant about Peter's worst moment. There are three things I, I want us to notice about it today. First, I want you to notice that Peter's worst moment was remarkable. Now, the Cambridge Dictionary defines remarkable as unusual or special and therefore surprising. Unusual or special and therefore surprising. And that's an appropriate description of Peter's worst moment because Peter's worst moment was surprising. Now, why would, you, why would I say that Peter's worst moment is surprising? It's because Peter, at this moment, is at an all-time spiritual mountaintop. Think about the situation. They're in Jerusalem for the Passover. The apostles did not want Jesus to go to Jerusalem on this occasion. The apostles wanted him to stay away from Jerusalem because they were afraid the chief priests would have him killed. But here they are, nearing the end of the week, and nothing's happened yet. In fact, their week has been filled with a a donkey and palm leaf themed parade, a brouhaha in the temple in which which the tables were overturned, and a Passover feast where there was a foot washing and a debate about who was the greatest. They're nearing the end of the week, and Jesus is still safe. And his popularity might be greater than it ever has been. At this moment, I'm certain Peter is on cloud nine. But then Jesus said something. If you turn over to Matthew chapter 26 and you look at the, verse 31, they're on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus, out of nowhere, says, You will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Peter is the first to respond to what Jesus says. He's taken aback by what Jesus says. He doesn't believe that's possible. And Peter says in the very next verse, or in verse 33, I should say, Peter says, though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Now pay attention to what Peter's saying. His words, they're bold, they're confident, and to a degree they're arrogant because he's essentially saying, everybody else might mess up, but not me. I'm the guy. I've got this. Peter has such a bravado here. He'll even, a couple verses later in verse 35 of the chapter, add this to his statement. Even... If I must die with you, I will not deny you. And let's be honest. Peter tried to live up to this statement. When that mob came to arrest Jesus, Peter pulled out a sword and went to war. I alluded to this earlier in John chapter 18 and verse 10. We read that Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. Now, it wasn't Peter's goal to cut off this guy's ear. He wasn't such a skilled swordsman that in one quick motion he could chop off ears like a hibachi chef preparing the volcanic onion. The most likely scenario is that Peter swung horizontally at this guy's neck and this guy ducked his head to avoid it and that's when Peter grazed off his ear. Peter was swinging for heads. Because Peter was ready for war. Peter was all in for Jesus. If that meant a battle, Peter was ready to battle. If that meant death, Peter was ready to die. Peter was in the Garden of Gethsemane like it was a war zone because he was that devoted to Jesus at this moment. But then Jesus surrendered. And Peter's world was turned upside down. 
He knew Jesus was the Messiah. He knew Jesus was the Son of God. He knew Jesus would be establishing his kingdom. He just misunderstood what kind of kingdom it would be. And so when Jesus was bound, so was Peter's boldness. I want you to realize something. We're not unlike Peter. Peter's worst moment happens while he's at his spiritual mountaintop. And hasn't that happened for you? Maybe you come back from Bible camp or a retreat or, or a mission trip and you're at a spiritual high point. You've never been closer to the Lord. You've got a whole new outlook on life. You've got a whole new level of commitment. But after a couple of weeks, the spiritual fire has diminished. And you find yourself giving in to a subtle temptation all too quickly, and you're left wondering, why did I let myself do that? Or maybe you're motivated by a powerful message from God's Word, and it it, it, it challenges you to repent and recommit your life to the Lord or, or, or maybe to give your life to the Lord in the first place. And you respond to that invitation and prayers are said for you and hugs are given and encouragement is offered. But within a few hours, you find yourself doing the very thing you vowed not to do anymore. And you're left thinking, I'll never be a good Christian. We're not unlike Peter. We have those spiritual mountaintops, but guess what? Next to every mountain is a valley, and at some point, we're going to go through it. Let's remember what Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 18 says. Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Paul kind of adapted that proverb for his letter to the Corinthians when he wrote these words, Let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. The point of these two passages is not that it's impossible to avoid sinning. Instead, the point is that temptation is so strong and we are so weak that we should never believe ourselves to be spiritually invincible. Even the mightiest heroes of faith fall at some point in time. And so spiritual, set, spiritual success is not measured by the number of times you fall, but by the number of times you get up. So when we look at Peter's worst moment, what we need to see is that it was remarkable. It was surprising. It came when he was at his spiritual peak. So don't believe it's impossible for you to fall at any time. But there's something else about Peter's worst moment we need to acknowledge. And that is the fact that his worst moment was preventable. See, turn back with me to Matthew 26 again. Let's return to that moment when Peter boldly proclaimed that he would never fall away. Because after he said that, if you look at Matthew chapter 26, verse 34, you'll see that Jesus responded, Truly, I tell you, the, this very night... Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Think about that for a moment. Jesus predicted Peter's denial. Jesus told Peter up front, here's what you're going to do. Here's when you're going to do it. Peter had prior knowledge that he was going to sin. Peter knew that his sin was going to involve 
denying Jesus. Peter knew that he was going to commit this sin three times, and Peter knew that his sin would occur before the rooster crows. In other words, Peter had all the necessary information that could be used to prevent himself from sinning, and yet he still did it. You would think that after the first denial, after the first encounter with that servant girl, when he denies that he knows who Jesus is, you would think that would trigger in his mind this recollection of what Jesus had said. And he would change the outcome. But he didn't. And it's surprising because if you go over to Mark's account of this story, of this event, Mark chapter 14 and verse 68 tells us that after the first denial, the rooster crowed for the first time. But even that audible signal didn't trigger in his mind the, the, the memory of what Jesus had said. Once again, he has an opportunity to change the outcome, but he doesn't. And it should be noted that these denials did not happen in quick succession. Luke chapter 22 and verse 59 says that the third denial took place after an interval of about an hour from the second one. Peter had time to sit there and think about what he had done. After that second denial, Peter had time to reminisce on what had just happened. He had the opportunity to reflect on what Jesus had previously told him. He had an opportunity to change the outcome, but he didn't. The point is that there were plenty of opportunities and plenty of time for Peter to recognize that Jesus' prediction was about to come to fruition. And he could have stopped it, but he didn't. It wasn't until after the rooster crowed the final time that Peter realized what he had done, and according to Luke chapter 22, verse 61, it was at that moment that Jesus turned and looked at Peter, and Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And then after making that eye contact with Jesus, we're told that Peter went outside and wept bitterly. The fact that Peter's sin was completely preventable, might be what makes this his worst moment. He had been told he was going to deny Jesus, but despite knowing what he was going to do, how many times he was going to do it, and when he was going to do it, he couldn't stop himself from doing it. And we're not unlike Peter. Peter. We've been forewarned that we're going to sin. Romans chapter 3, verse 23, Paul, by the inspiration of the Spirit, wrote that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, this verse does not say that every one of us will sin every day. All this verse says is that every one of us will sin at least once in our lifetime. So we need to be careful not to draw the conclusion that sin is constantly unavoidable because that's not what the Bible teaches. In fact, the Bible gives us an insight that should prevent us from sinning, just as Jesus gave an insight to Peter. That insight comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. This is the verse that comes immediately after one we read a moment ago in which in which Paul said, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he falls. The very next verse, which is probably well known to you, says this, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. We've been told in advance that every temptation is avoidable. We've been told in advance that God has provided us a way of escape for each and every temptation we face. That just means when we encounter temptation, 
We have to be looking for the exit. Peter's worst moment and our worst moments don't happen because they are unavoidable. They happen because we're not observational. Because we're not looking for God's given way of escape. So we need to stop approaching temptation and sin with a defeatist mentality. We need to start approaching it with a victor's mentality because it can be conquered if we look for God's escape route. Peter had those opportunities that night. Peter had those reminders, those signals, the the time to alter the outcome. And guess what? Every time you and I face temptation, there are opportunities for us to alter the outcome as well. Because every sin, every worst moment is completely preventable. Thus far we've seen that Peter's worst moment was remarkable and that Peter's worst moment was preventable. But those aren't the most important things to know about Peter's worst moment. The most important thing to know about Peter's worst moment is that it was forgivable. This isn't evident when you look at the text of Matthew 26. To see how Peter's worst moment was forgivable, even redeemable, You have to journey ahead in the story to John chapter 21, verse 15 and 17, which we read a moment ago, but I'd like for us to read again. John chapter 21, beginning in verse 15. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lamps. Jesus said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. Jesus said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. The one feature of this conversation that most Bible students will quickly pick up on is the fact that Jesus asks Peter, do you love me three times? Which is the exact same number of times that Peter denied his relationship with Jesus. But there are a couple of other minor details that connect this conversation back to that notorious night as well. Notice that this conversation took place after they had eaten breakfast. And what did they use to cook their breakfast that morning? According to John chapter 21 and verse 9, they used a charcoal fire. There is only one other place in the Bible where reference is made to a charcoal fire, to that specific detail. And that reference is made in John chapter 18, verse 18, where we are told that Peter was standing and warming himself next to a charcoal fire when he denied Jesus the first time. And notice, here in John 21, as they were having this conversation, as Jesus was asking Peter, do you love me these three times? The disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. You see that in John chapter 21 and verse 20. This unnamed disciple is John, the author of this gospel. Every time John refers to himself in his gospel, he uses a vague title like this. And such was also the case back in John chapter 18, verses 15 and 16, where we learn that Peter gained access to the high priest's courtyard because another disciple who accompanied him, was known to the high priest. Now, I know that phrase, another disciple, is not the same as the disciple whom Jesus loved. 
but every indication suggests that it's the same person. And that means when Peter denied Jesus in the high priest's courtyard, John was nearby. And when Jesus gave Peter a do-over on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, John was nearby. And while these details may seem insignificant, they are intentionally here to connect the dots between what happened that night in the high priest's courtyard and what happened that morning on the shores of Galilee. And now I want you to consider what's said between Jesus and Peter. Oftentimes, and I've preached the sermon and others have preached sermons on the use of the word love in this passage. Because Jesus' term for love, the first two times he asks Peter, do you love me, is different than the term for love that Peter responds with. Whether that is significant is a matter of debate among scholars. But that's not what I want to talk about this morning. Because I think there's another word choice that might be more significant. And it's the name that Jesus used when he spoke to Peter. Every time Jesus spoke to Peter in this passage, he referred to him as Simon, son of John. Verse 15, verse 16, verse 17. Every time, Simon son of John. Now that is Peter's legal name. You have to remember, Peter is the Greek version of the nickname that Jesus gave to him long ago. As a result, he is routinely referred to as Simon, parentheses, who is called Peter, or simply Simon Peter. But more often than not, his nickname gets used, Peter. What I find so very interesting is how and when Jesus chooses to use each of Peter's unique names. You see, when Peter is at his lowest, when Peter has his worst moments, Jesus uses that nickname, Peter. It's Peter who got out of the boat and walked on the water until he saw the wind and was afraid and began to sink Matthew chapter 14, verse 29 and 30. And it's Peter who then heard Jesus say, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? As he rescued him from those waters. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 31. It's Peter who rebuked Jesus for talking about his upcoming death in Jerusalem. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 22. And it's Peter who heard Jesus say, Get behind me, Satan! In verse 23 of that chapter. It's Peter who, while present on the Mount of Transfiguration, naively suggested that they make three tents for Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. It's Peter who pulls out a sword in the Garden of Gethsemane and cuts off the ear of the high priest's servant, only to have Jesus rebuke him and tell him to put the sword away in John chapter 18, verse 10 and 11. And of course, it's Peter who denies Jesus three times there in Matthew chapter 26. In all of Peter's worst moments, Jesus called him Peter. But in the high points of his life, when he was at his best, Jesus would refer to him as Simon, the son of John. When Peter was introduced to Jesus by his brother Andrew in John chapter 1 and verse 42 and ultimately was recruited to become a disciple, Jesus said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas. And John explains that Cephas means Peter. So when Jesus first met this guy, he used his official name, Simon, the son of John. Then in Matthew chapter 16, after Peter said that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So Jesus used Peter's official name, 
Simon Barjona, Simon son of John, when he made the great confession. Now, I bring these names up because at this moment, Jesus chose to address Simon, not as Peter, the nickname he used to remind him to be stronger and better in his lowest moments. But he used Simon, son of John, the formal name he used when he wanted to communicate what he was, that he was proud of him. And in so doing, Jesus, Jesus demonstrated that he still loved Peter. He demonstrated that he had forgiven Peter. By the choice of name, he demonstrated that Peter was still his disciple. See, the ultimate lesson we can take away from Peter's worst moment is that you are more than your worst moment. Because on the cross, Jesus redeemed every moment. Look at what the Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse 6 through 11. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore... We have now been justified by His blood. Much more shall we be saved by Him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by His life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Paul says that Jesus died while we were still weak while we were still sinners, and while we were enemies. Paul emphasizes the point that Jesus didn't die because of our best moments. He died because of our worst moments, and he did that so that we could be justified, so that we could be reconciled, so that we could be saved, because it's our worst moments that prevent that. But on the cross, Jesus, who knew no sin, was made to be sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. That means that Jesus, who never had a bad moment in his life, intentionally accepted all of our bad moments and suffered the consequences of them so that each and every one of us could be bad momentless in the eyes of God. You are more than your worst moment because Jesus redeemed every moment. So while we're here this morning, I'm certain you can envision right now your worst moment. I'm certain right now you can bring it up into the, re- into the forefront of your mind And maybe it's not just one moment. Maybe it's a series of moments. But you can see them. You can relive them. It might send chills down your spine. It might give you goosebumps. It might make you want to vomit, to think about your worst moment. Your worst moment drove a nail through the hands of Jesus. Your worst moment forced a thorn into his skull. Your worst moment shred open his back with a lash. Your worst moment took his last living breath. Your worst moment put him on the cross. But because he died and rose again, your worst moment can stay there. 
You just have to be willing to surrender your life to Him. This morning, you may need to make a decision to become a child of God. And you can do that, and you can have your worst moments redeemed by confessing that Jesus Christ is the Lord, and that He is the Son of God, and that He is alive today. By repenting of your sins, and by being immersed in water, where you come in contact with the blood of Jesus that washes those sins away. Maybe you need to make that decision today. If so, we encourage you to do so while together we stand and sing.